east from his dissertation work in the West, so I hope you've acclimated by now, Chris. I, I have, well, I did my dissertation work in the Bahamas. So oh, well. <laughs> it's pretty chilly up here. <laughs> yeah. No pity for Chris. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Bill. Um, I also want to thank the uh, entire uh, committee for putting together the symposium uh, and giving me a chance to talk a little bit about what my lab has been doing on artificial reefs the past few years. And I, of course, want to acknowledge my co-authors here. Is this the right one? Yeah. Okay, so today I'm going to uh, present three studies. Uh, two of these are still ongoing. In fact, one of them is, is very new. Uh, in the first study, we are measuring biological production on paired artificial and natural reefs uh, for a couple of different species of fishery concern. In the second study, which we recently completed, uh, we measured the participant use, so the boat visitation rates, to the same reefs where we're measuring production uh, in study one. And that's a completed study. And then in study three, this is the one that's fresh off the... Um, the starting line, really, it's not even off the printer, uh, is we're taking some of this information on production, uh, fishing intensity that we're measuring, and the distribution of fishing effort in order to try to get an estimate of how that might affect fishery yield. And so I do have a little bit of uh, results that I can share from that at the end. And that, that's a modeling study. The other two are empirical field studies. The system that we're working in is located very near here. Um, and we have been studying eight artificial reefs and natural reefs. Uh, these reefs are arranged in pairs. So within each pair, there's one natural reef and one artificial reef. And we have two pairs that are located near shore in waters of about 10 to 15 meters of water uh, depth, and uh, two pairs located offshore at about 25 to 30 meters. And what we're assuming by pairing these up is that the environmental variables such as depth, temperature, delivery of larvae, et cetera, are going to be uh, consistent at least within the pair. And so that way we can isolate the effect of habitat type. And then I'm going to attempt in the talk to, oops, is it this one? To use, um, so I use circles for the nearshore sites and triangles for the offshore sites. Uh, filled symbols for artificial and uh, open symbols for natural. Okay, so on to the, the first question of measuring biological production. Uh, in order to do that, in order to actually measure tissue production, you need a lot of information. So um, we go out seasonally and, con and conduct uh, underwater visual census surveys. We've been doing this since 2013. Um, these estimates are broken down into size classes. And then within each of those size classes, we measure the amount of somatic production, which we get from um, uh, sampling some of the fish, taking them back to the lab, and uh, uh, estimating growth from back calculated uh, estimates. And then those are summed uh, across the size classes for our somatic growth. A uh, similar process for the gonadal production. So here we're measuring the sum of the egg and the milk production per size class. and then. The metric that we're interested in is total production, which is just the sum of somatic and gonadal production. So conceptually, very easily, um, but it does require a lot of field work. It requires collections, and then it requires uh, quite a bit of lab processing. Um, there's a key assumption here that the production that we're measuring actually came from the reefs where we're collecting and, and seeing these fish. And for a lot of reef fishes, uh, we can probably just go with, well, we know that they tend to have high levels of site fidelity. But we're measuring that by comparing uh, isotope values between uh, muscle tissue and liver tissue and finding that, that they're close to equilibrium indicating, so these tissues turn over at different rates. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested in isotope ecology, there's a whole session on Thursday. Um, but they turn over at different rates, and so if they're close to equilibrium with one another, then we can assume that um, we are seeing high levels of site fidelity, and in fact we are with these species. And so we're studying gray snapper and white grunt. Uh, we chose these two species because they're abundant, they're ubiquitous in this system, and they're also a fisheries concern, primarily in the recreational sector, uh, but also in the commercial sector to a lesser degree. 
Okay, so in the next two slides, it's going to look like this, but with actual data. So here are the gray snapper. Uh, now, I put up the density somatic production and gonadal production plots in case you're interested, but I'm going to focus on uh, the far right for the total production. Again, notice that the circles are the shallow water sites, triangles are deep water, uh, filled are uh, the artificial reefs. So the first thing to notice with the gray snapper is there was, there was higher production uh, on the deeper sites than on the shallow sites, but within the two depth zones, there was no effect of reef type. Okay, so this is from one year of, of data. This is an ongoing study. And actually, we, we uh, are in the process of uh, sampling and, and processing more uh, gray snapper right now. Uh, here are the results from the first year for white grunt. Again, focusing our attention on the far right. Again, there was a depth effect, but this time higher production on the shallow sites than on the deep sites. And here we are seeing uh, slight evidence of uh, higher production on natural reefs compared to artificial reefs. And to some degree, this might, I'm kind of giving away the, the punchline of the second study, but to some degree, this might be driven by very high fishing pressure on uh, the shallow reefs, uh, particularly the shallow artificial reefs. White grunt are probably the easiest fish to catch <laughs> in this entire system, and they're actually pretty tasty. And so, uh, you know, a lot of your weekend warriors will go out and I think hammer them. Uh, so that's what uh, might be driving this pattern. Okay, so the second study, and I've already given you a little bit of the punchline for this, is we wanted to know what the participant use was on these eight reefs that we've been studying. And so our question was, what are the boater visitation rates to these reefs, and are they equivalent to each other? And so in order to measure that, we attached passive acoustic receivers uh, near each of these reefs. They were, we put them 100 meters away from them to uh, avoid uh, them getting entangled in fishing gear and anchors, but they can, they can listen to the ambient environment uh, much further than that. So they're, they're, the, the kernel that they're listening is, is much greater. Um, and these are great because we can put them out leave them out there. We left them out for two years. We had to swap them seasonally for battery purposes and to download the data. Um, but we can have a synoptic design. Uh, they listen during the day. They listen at night. They listen when the weather's crappy. So a great uh, way of collecting data, uh, but it collects a whole lot of data. Uh, so about a million files, uh, about a terabyte of data. So how do you go about detecting boat noise in that many data files? Well, fortunately, I might not have enough time for that, but fortunately, um, you can, uh, these are spectrograms for a file with, with no boats present and one with a boat present. And fortunately, they have some distinguishing characteristics when the boats are, in fact, present. Uh, first of all, they are characterized by harmonics, and so these are these horizontal bands that you see. And they're also characterized by a higher sound amplitude at the lower frequencies. So um, that white box isn't showing up very clearly, but, but notice how much darker it is down here than up here, okay? And so we created a boat detection algorithm which can detect both of these characteristics. And so um, we had to first train the model, or the algorithm. We did that with over 2,700 boat files in which we manually inspected each of these so we knew exactly whether or not it had uh, boat noise in it. And then we found that it had uh, a very good success rate, so at around 95%, so it worked well. Um, but then you have to convert the number of detections into the number of boats that we're seeing. And to do that, I'm not going to go through each of these, but just, just note that we had to calculate the probability of a lot of different components, some for the whole system and some for each individual reef. And so there was a filtering process uh, that we had to do. Okay, so the next slide are my data. And instead of giving uh, some kind of central tendency plot here, I'm plotting the dynamics because I think there's something interesting with the dynamics. So first, these are the two shallow water sites. This is, this is the northern pair on the top and the southern pair on the bottom. Uh, notice the scale of the y-axis. So it's up to 200 days on the top and 180, not days, 
mean boat visitations per day, per day. So it goes up to 200 uh, for the shallow water pair on the north and 180 for the shallow water pair in the south. Uh, artificial reefs in the black bars, uh, natural reefs in the white bars. So the first thing to notice here is there's a high level of temporal variability. Uh, much higher visitation rates in the summer, uh, the warmer months compared to the winter. Not terribly surprising. Again, these are kind of the weekend warrior kinds of uh, reefs. But the other thing that jumps out here is, and, and we've heard this in a couple of talks today, um, is that the, uh, the visitation rates are about 10 times on the, to the artificial reefs compared to the natural reefs. And that's likely because a lot of, especially the weekend warrior types, don't have the, the lat lawns for the natural reefs, so whereas uh, the artificial reefs are published. Here are the offshore sites, uh, the deeper water sites. Again, north on top, south on bottom. Again, look, notice the uh, change in the y-axis. The scale is up to 50 uh, in the northern pair and up to 16 in the southern pair. We also see more temporal stability uh, throughout the year. Uh, with some interesting peaks actually in the late winter and early spring. And I've, I, uh, we had some interesting conversations last night. I have a, a poster uh, with some of these data. And uh, we were trying to brainstorm what might be happening with this. I at first thought that maybe these were uh, the guys that usually go further offshore and might have been relegated to staying inshore a little bit because um, weather was keeping them offshore in those kind of nastier winter months. Um, but another, op another uh, potential, and this is all speculation, another potential thing that could be affecting it is, is uh, amberjack showing up on these reefs in pretty high densities during that time of year. Um, but again, notice that the visitation rates to the artificial reefs was higher than to the natural reefs. Not as, not as high as what we saw inshore, but uh, somewhere between about 2 and 8 percent. Okay, so after we got those results, um, I then started talking to a colleague of mine um, that's a modeler, and I said, you know, how do, we, how do we put all these pieces together and estimate how that might influence fishery yield? And so the idea is that as we add artificial reefs to a system, which we're showing here in yellow, um, how does that influence the behavior of the fishermen? And, and I, I just realized I didn't make a connection here. The boater visitation rates is, is, what is one way that we're um, assuming uh, is the distribution of fishing effort. And I think that's a pretty safe assumption because it's been my observation, and I've never gotten a lot of pushback on this, that pretty much 95%, if not more, of the people that are visiting these reefs are either spear fishing or they're hook and line fishing. Okay, so this gives us some idea of the distribution of fishing effort. And so it can occur in, in, in two different ways when we uh, deploy artificial reefs. They can either be redistributed or there might be some kind of additive effect. People learn about their reefs and so more people enter into uh, that local fishery. And so to get at this, um, and I'm not going to belabor on this slide, um, we created an age-structured, spatially implicit model. This is an equilibrium state model. Um, and I'm not going to go through these, but notice that we can, we can adjust a couple of things within this model. We can adjust the, the distribution of the fishermen, um, and that, that feeds into um, the level of attraction. And we based these, uh, the level of attraction based on uh, the study, too, that we just uh, that I just presented. So whether it's uh, equivalent, uh, about two times, which was, which was our lower um, level, and about ten times, which is our upper level. Uh, and we base this on uh, the demographic weight rates of white grunt, um, which is the other one of the species that we're studying. However, this is a, a flexible model. You can, you can apply this to, to any number of species. Okay, now I'm going to walk us through this. Um, so on the x-axis, we have artificial reefs as a percent of total natural area, okay? So for example, if we're, at, if we're at 100, that means we have just as much artificial habitat in the system as natural habitat. Um, as we know from the previous couple of slides, it's nowhere near that, right? Uh, so we were, uh, Gulf-wide, we're talking about 0.15%. 
the x-axis is the yield that we're looking at, uh, that we're interested in, and this is the percent change from a no artificial reef scenario. And then the black line is our reference line of a one-to-one -one increase in yield as the habitat increases. And um, I'm not going to, I'm not plotting out the one-to-one -one ratios here. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the non-attraction, so equal uh, fishing rate on artificial reefs as compared to natural reefs. When we do, it more or less tracks this line. Um, so we're going to keep that off just to keep it clean here. But when we plot the effort is twice as high on the, nat on the artificial reefs as compared to the natural reefs, for both of these, we see a decrease in yield at first, um, followed by if it's a purely additive effect at some point, which crosses around 100%, uh, uh, it actually exceeds that one-to-one -one line. But for the redis uh, redistributed effort, it actually stays below it the entire time. And again, as a reference, the talks that we've seen earlier, we're actually way over here in terms of the realized amount of artificial habitat. And then the, the 10x uh, scenario actually exaggerates that, that same pattern, more or less. Um, now, let me back up. I didn't mention this. These were at uh, fishing levels of near MSY. Um, but we're also playing around with, with the harvest rates. So, and when we do that, uh, in both the over-exploitation and the under-exploitation scenarios, um, the results are qualitatively similar. Uh, and to some degree, they're quantitatively similar as well. OK, so a few take-home points here. Um, we saw some depth effects uh, for both species and a little bit of um, reef-type effects for uh, the white grunt. Uh, boater visitation rates, which we again assume give us some idea of the distribution of fishing effort, uh, was much higher on the artificial reefs compared to the natural reefs. And again, some of these very early, and I do want to emphasize that, uh, modeling efforts uh, suggest that um, the fishery yield will decrease if the effort is concentrated on the artificial reefs. So those artificial reefs are just getting hammered, and so the overall fishery yield uh, decreases as a result. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chris. We do have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Really cool stuff. Are you able to distinguish uh, between fishermen kind of behavior? So, for example, like, a boat that's live boating for reef fish versus trolling or anything like that? Uh, in terms of the acoustic data? Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. with respect to acoustics, thanks. Yeah, you can. In fact, that that's what, um, that's actually what initially uh, sparked the idea to conduct that study. My, my colleague,